Perhaps I should not have been a fisherman, he thought, but that was the thing I was born for. And that's a quote from The Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. And I bring that quote up because it reminds me of today's guest. Today I'm speaking to Mr. Pat Healy. Pat is the president of Viking Yachts. And for the past four decades, he's been making some of the premier fishing vessels ever to hit the water. He started working for Viking Yachts at 10 years old. His father was part of the World War II generation, and he was one of the, one of the guys who helped start the company. And as a young kid, Pat was exposed to boat building. Not only boat building, he was exposed to fishing. You see, while his father was working on the weekends, he'd tell one of his guys to take Pat fishing. And the fishing bug hit Pat really, really hard. He's been obsessed with it ever since he was a young boy. And that definitely translates over to Viking yachts. I mean, when you see one of these vessels, you see that it was definitely built for fishing. The massive work area in the back, uh, the way things perform. When you see one of these things on the water, you see that profile, you see how beautiful it is. And then when you see it move, you're like, how can a boat that size move like that? Pat's been an innovator. He uses fishing tournaments to actually inform him and his team as to what the design of his fishing boat should be. And he's also moved into other areas. Uh, recently, he helped start Valhalla Boat Works, and that's a, a, a sister company to Viking Yachts that makes open top center consoles for fishing. This conversation was absolutely awesome. We get into Pat's beginnings. We talk about his childhood, what it was like growing up as the son of a boat builder and what, what it was like growing up with Viking Yachts. We talk a bit about his philosophy. We talk about fishing and you know, we talk about him as an individual and where he sees this industry going. You're going to get a whole lot out of this interview, a whole lot of advice from somebody who's been on the water practically his whole life. And you're going to get a lot of insights as to what it takes to be one of the best boat builders in the world. My name is Chris Albert and welcome to American Made Boating. Uh, this is broadcast is brought to you by Fortress Marine Anchors. I am the host of American Made Boating, but I'm also the director of sales and marketing for Fortress Marine Anchors. And my job here is to introduce you to the people, the personalities, and the companies that make up the American boating industry. And when you listen to the show, you're going to get some insights that are going to help you to get the most out of your boat, the most out of your time on the water. Uh, but also to get the most out of this lifestyle. You see, that's what this really is. When you buy a boat, you're really buying freedom. You're buying the ability to get out on the water whenever you want to, to go fishing whenever you want to, and to get away from it all for a little bit. So hope you get a lot out of this show, and I know you're going to get a whole lot out of this episode. And with that, let's get into this awesome conversation with Mr. Pat Healy of Viking Yachts. Welcome to American Made Boating, brought to you by Fortress Marine Anchors. Each week we're bringing you the best boating knowledge, insights, and stories from some of the most amazing people in the American boating industry. Set your anchor, turn up your speakers, and get ready for an awesome show. Mr. Pat Healy, welcome to American Made Boating. How are you doing today? It's a great, it's another great day. I'm building a boat. I'm building a bunch of boats today. So it's uh, any day you get to come and come to our factory. It's a great day. Well, you make some absolutely outstanding boats, and uh, you know, I'm like I told you before we got on. I'm just a a massive fan of what you do. I'm always looking at pictures of Viking yachts. That that is my dream boat. So uh, I'm really excited to have you here. Well, I thank you for uh, your enthusiasm for our product. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a great product. It's a great industry. It's a great lifestyle. It's just fun. 100%. So I want to get started by asking you, you know, you started your career 
at Viking at, at 10 years old. You're sweeping the floors. Uh, you learned every aspect of that company. And in a lot of ways, you grew up with Viking yachts and Viking yachts grew up with you. Um, what was your childhood? What was your childhood like being the son of a boat builder? Well, my dad, um, he worked six days a week. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, during the summer months, I was here uh, during the week. And and actually, in the summer, he would probably just do five days a week because we grew up in all on the beach down in Cape May. And he liked the beach as much as we did or fishing or whatever it was. But in the wintertime, I would come to work every Saturday with him. We'd work at three quarters of a day. Uh, maybe if there was a, a delivery or a boat show coming or a new model, it would be stretched out into six or seven days. I just enjoyed it. You know, I'd come down, hang out with the guys, you know, it, and, uh, you know, Elvia started sweeping floors and, you know, by 13, I'm driving a dump truck and, uh, and that's our trash truck, taking it to the dump, which was, you know, in those days, that's 40 years ago, uh, you know, it was right behind the facility. And, uh, so that, that was, there were just fun times. Um, uh, I enjoyed it, uh, learned a lot during it, uh, was mentored by, some, you know, some guys that have been doing it all their lives. And, and, and that was a, a positive thing. And, and the work ethic, you know, getting to understand the work ethic that was, I had no choice. That was just instilled in me from day one. Uh, so that made a big, a big difference. I think in that uh, I've only known how to work and work long days and short nights and, 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 and always be committed to the project that you're on and, making sure you get it done within the, uh, a lot of time frame. So that's, uh, that's a lot of, uh, of it. And, and it, again, it was just the people. And, and some days, you know, I, my dad would say, all right, go ahead, take the next two hours and go fishing off the dock down at the uh, basin. And, you know, I'd go down there and catch a little striped bass. And that really got me hooked on fishing. I mean, striped bass, perch, uh, we would catch and then an occasional eel, Uh, you know, and an eel that was, they were something else to get off the hook (laughs) of the stripers you could get off the perch you could get off, but getting an eel off that, you know, he'd have my line all twisted up and Uh all the guys would come down. I'd run up like, man, I got this snake on and then (laughs) not, it's not a snake. It's an eel. And so, and, and some of them were big three feet long and, uh, inch, inch and a half in diameter. And, um, so it was just a lot of fun coming. It was always something different every day. In those days at Viking, you had to think, you know, 40 years ago, it was 150 people. And it was here at the Jersey Shore. And we would uh, live inland for the winter months. And then we'd be on the coast in the summer months. So, Wow, that sounds like a great childhood. And uh, I grew up in Connecticut and I had an Italian grandfather and we used to go fishing with these bamboo poles. And I remember catching eel and, and they'd fight like a son of a gun. And then, yeah, they'd, they'd tangle everything up. And my grandfather yeah. loved them for uh, Christmas dinner. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they would, then they showed me how to, you know, it was a, you know, a big finishing nail or not a, a penny, uh, a roofing nail, mm-hmm. banging into the piling. Yep. Chop its head off and skin it. Oh, and yeah. It was all meat. That, you know, that's how they, I was like, hey, listen, I wasn't eating that when I was a youngster. And I don't know if I'd eat I haven't. I haven't tried to eat it. Probably they would cook it on a grill. Mm-hmm. You know, at, 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 at lunch, you know, at that time, you know, people would have grills at lunch. And, and it would be like, no, nah, I'm not eating that. No, I'll eat that. <laughs> I'll eat weak fish, flounder. But no, nah, in those days, I wouldn't eat meal. That just didn't uh, excite me. Yeah, yeah. We had that. We had the bacala, the salt cod. It was a uh, bacala. There we yeah, go. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, you know, at your core, you you you're really a fisherman, right? Uh, yeah. But there was a time when Viking was was really focused on cruisers, and mm-hmm. today, you know, you guys have made this this transition. You make some of the best fishing vessels ever created. How did that transformation occur? Well, I think it was like anything, you know, like if I wasn't here in New Gretna, I was on a rock pile jetty in Cape May or my uncle Chappie uh, was taking me out on, on party boats, uh, catching sea bass and flounder. 
out of Cape May. And, um, you know, we just, we just fished. I mean, uh, and the, my dad was so busy uh, running the yacht company that uh, he didn't have that time always to spend doing that. So my uncle Chappie was a big fisherman, and, but we had guys here, you know, he would rather say, Hey, Zeke, take Pat fishing. I'm going to stay here and work. And, you know, and, and he, he did. And so I didn't have any uh, for people to go with when I was 10, 11, 12, I always had plenty of people to go with. Uh, and he was always here, you know, designing and building boats. And uh, so I got all that fishing time in and, and I got a bad case of it, you know, and I just enjoyed it. And as I got older, I got my own little boat, a 14 footer that I redid a Thunderbird and uh, put a, a new Johnson on the back of it and put that on a trailer. I got in my license and then I had my own boat and I could trailer it up and down the Jersey coast and put it in and chase, chase weak fishing out of Cape May and stripers out of Cape May and flounder out of the great Bay and, and maybe ocean city, New Jersey. And I mean, I could just kind of move around a little bit, water ski do all. I was a big surfer too. I surfed a lot when I was younger. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was from all the, the time on the beach. And the problem was with the surfing, it was great in the, in the fall, you know, the waves were killer. The, the problem was, is during the summer months, you could, you know, when the weather was beautiful, you went fishing. Mm-hmm. When the weather was crappy, there's usually was waves. So then you would surf. So it was a great, and you'll see today, a lot of your surfers are also fishermen yep. because, you know, you, you, it, it's very rare that, that you have great waves on a, on a good day. Maybe you get an offshore breeze or something that you have, but then you can only fish in tight to the beach. So it was a great filler piece. And you go from surfing, fishing, water skiing. It was just, uh, it was a great, you know, just a, a water rat, you know, you couldn't keep me, I couldn't stay out of the body surfing. It didn't matter. Whatever you could do to be in the water. That was all about. I was. Uh, and w- was your dad initially resistant to the change and trying to focus on fishing with the business or? No, because, you know, what, what had happened was a couple of our suppliers had bought boats mm-hmm. and those suppliers were using those boats to promote their products. And, in the, and, 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 and it was also promoting our product. Mm-hmm. So I kind of rode along with some of my first offshore trips were with Giles and Ransom, they had a, a 40 Viking, a 35 Viking, uh, that they, that they put 3208s in to promote their engines. And so I would ride along with them and, uh, and fishing for tuna and, and, you know, Marlon back then, well, oh my God, if you caught two of them or three of them, that was a huge successful season. Now, if you don't catch that in a day, it's bad. Uh, and so I, I think that that really, you know, started the push, uh, for me and my dad always was very receptive to building sport fish boats, uh, where he and I got sideways was once I got out of college, that's all I wanted to do. Yeah. And, uh, uh, fish, you know, design fish boats, uh, go fishing, go to tournaments, uh, and all of that. And, and his idea was, no, you had to work and do that all on the side. And I'm like, well, no, the, the tournaments are Thursday through Saturday or Sunday. And so it was one and my uncle, uh, Bob was always there to kind of shepherd me through the obstacles and keep uh, my father and I from total disagreement. And so we, we were successful in doing that. And I would say the last 20 years uh, was not a problem. The 10 years prior to that, let's say over a 30 year period, 10 years, we had our battles over it. We had our battles of that the pop. This is what we got to do. We have to be there. Uh, we have to be part of it. And of course, in the end, he would come up and he would say, you were on the money on that one. 
but 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 he would still give me a bag of crap. <laughs> but, you know, but he he conceded that we were right for spending that amount of time, energy, and effort. And he was just old school. Is old school, not was. Is old school. And um, you know, it's he was a marine, and um, like I said, he wouldn't take time off to go fishing with me as a young. He would get a guy here that worked here that he knew he was going fishing and he would say, Hey, take Pat fishing with you. Okay. You got an extra spot. Take Pat. Yeah. So that would, I think I'm coming down here to sweep floors. The next thing you know, I'm on a boat headed out to the, uh, to the great Bay and, uh, and we're striper fishing, flounder fishing or wheat fishing. So it was all good stuff. It was all gotcha. good. Well, as somebody who I, I served in the Marine Corps for six years and I, I can tell you, we are a stubborn bunch, so I can I can see where the battles occurred. And, and you know, my grandfather had the steel business, steel erection business, and he would always say, "Hey, it's better that uh, it, it just thank you, just be grateful that you're not on the iron pile today, and you're you're in a boatyard." You know, yeah. and I grew up on the iron pile, and that was dif- more difficult, and blah 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 blah. So. Oh, good. Well, when did you realize that that this was your path, that you wanted to do this for the rest of your life? And did you do you ever see yourself doing anything else? No, no. I, I right away. I mean, it was uh, I understood the path of life for me was to be a boat builder right from the get go. I, I didn't I didn't have any other idea of anything else that I was going to do except build boats. That's what I wanted to do. So uh, that was an easy decision. And uh the luxury tax came along and I said, Oh, Oh my goodness. I should have done better in school. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm like, this, looks like this boat building thing may not work out. And fortunately, Hey, through a three year, you know, I was a young gentleman and, uh, at that point and, uh, and ran hard of ground right into the luxury tax. I was getting married and starting a family and it was like, Holy moly, this is, this isn't good. This isn't good, but hey, we 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 grew up a lot during that period. It was mm-hmm. rough and tumble, and and uh, became very instrumental in um, the success of getting through that. Uh, the success of my uncle headed up the repeal of the luxury tax for the industry, and mm-hmm. he sent me all over the country to go to boat shows, even boat shows that we weren't in to conduct town hall meetings basically with other industry uh, people to, to give them where we were, what we were doing and what do we need them to do right. uh, with their local political uh, uh, representatives. So it was, um, it was, it was a, a, a difficult time, but again, we learned an awful lot through it and grew from it and became a better boat builder and uh, and all the other things that went along with it. And then we came out of that luxury tax, guns a blazing, baby, guns a blazing, with a whole lot of new fish boat ideas and making production boats, custom boats, and taking all of those neat features that all the custom guys had developed through the years, but the pro- production boat builders didn't utilize. That was our first goal. Was taking all those neat things that they did and incorporate that into production boats. So that was our first major push. And that was 94, 95. And since then it's, let's call it, it's been history, you know, with 35, 40 designs later since then. And um, just tremendous, just tremendous, uh, tremendous team here. The people that I am, I am privileged to work with every day are the best of the best. And, uh, We've been doing it together for a while, and uh, and we do it very well together. That's amazing. There's so much there. I mean, you know, it, it, for companies, it's really those hard times that are going to drive innovation if if you work at it and if if you accept it. And you know, rather than sitting there and and saying "woe is me," getting out there and really innovating and working to get through those obstacles, that's what makes a company, and and that's awesome. Absolutely. So, you know, speaking of innovation, you guys use the fishing tournaments in a huge way 
to, to learn about your market and to create innovations for your fishing boats. When, when did you start realizing that the tournaments were a real source of knowledge and, and how'd you get the idea for it? Again, it goes all the way back to those few early boats in the late seventies that vendors had purchased from us. And there was a, only a couple tournaments then. The Cape May or the Atlantic City, a, a, a tournament out of Atlantic City, which was a big one, a tournament in Beach Haven, New Jersey, which was a big one, and one out of Cape May. This was before Dick Weber went down there and really blew it up with, with some incredible tournaments. But these were traditional tournaments. It was called the Cape May County Tournament. So they were three events, and they were all staggered one in July, one in the beginning of August, one in the end of August. and and that I, I loved the competition. Uh, you know, I just loved it. I, you know, I played basketball through school and, 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 you know, you just love the competition and, and that was, and, and, and then having all those customers all in one spot and maybe there was 30 boats then, and now there's 300 boats in some locations, uh, was just, I just loved the camaraderie and then, uh, meeting all the captains and it didn't have to be on a Viking boat. Could have been on any manufacturer's boat, uh, but seeing our customers there and seeing our vendors there and and seeing uh, other people in the in the community that I got to know that were fishing other brands and and some of them were driving custom boats and so I got to sit on them at night, have a beer or two, and ask them what about this, what about that, what about this, what about that. So it was a complete learning experience and. Uh, and then, you know, I took three years off between high school and, um, and college. I just, I was, I just wanted to work on boats and I traveled around with a guy, Bobby Walker, and we went all over the place fixing Vikings. And then uh, after that, I'm like, man, there gotta be a better, better way of living than getting up at five 30 every morning and work until six. So I went to college yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And said that, well, that, then that was the right decision. <laughs> and it was funny. Um, I, I was going to go to Rutgers mm -hmm. Camden. I was living with two high school roommates. One was going to Glassburg state and another one was working. And I was working here at the, at the Viking Yacht company. And, um, so I said, all right, well, I'll go to Rutgers. And I filled out an app and sent the app in and my uncle got wind of it. And he said, uh, I'd like to come up to my office. My uncle had an office in Haddonfield, New Jersey. And he said, uh, I walked in his office and he gives me a whole stack of papers. I said, what's this? And he says, it's your application for St. Joseph's you know, a College at the time, St. Joseph's College. Yep. And I said, well, no, I'm already going to Rutgers. I've already, I'm already accepted and, uh, you know, I'm going to live uh, – you know, my apartment uh, that I have is, you know, 10 minutes away and it's good, good situation. It's I'm not going up to New Brunswick and I'm going to go in and out commute. It's a communal, a commuter branch. And he says, no, you're not going there. And I said, I've he said, I already talked to Father Smith and you're going to St. Joe's. Oh, and by the way, I understand you want to be a marketing major. You're not going to be that either. And I said, what do you mean? He says, you're going to be an accounting major. Your father and I have decided that we'll teach you all the marketing you need to know, but uh, why don't we send you and we'll get you some background in some accounting. And that's what you really need to do. And I'm like, well, no, no. Well, of course, I went to St. Joe's and I was an accounting major. So I lost that battle. You pick your battles. And the worst part was it was summertime. And it would have been uh, end of July. And the boat, this was what, what one of the first demos that we had. And the boat, I was supposed to leave with the boat that morning to go to Ocean City, Maryland. For one, it was like the fourth tournament out of Ocean City, Maryland. And, uh, and, they, and I, I, I had to send a, a two other guys down with the boat. And then I went up to meet my uncle. Then I drove down and I was of course a little spun up over the whole deal. Mm. And back in those days you could hitchhike. So I'll, I drove to the Cape May ferry, got on the ferry, got on the other side of the ferry and hitchhiked to Ocean city, Maryland where the boat had already been. So, uh, 
So then we went out and we went fishing and caught some marlins. And uh, it was, that was my first time fishing that tournament. And that was it. I was really hooked. That was, that was, that was gut hooked on that one. So. Oh man. Uh, that that's amazing. And that's a crazy. Do you, do you have any regrets about the accounting? Oh, not at all. I mean, today yeah. I use it every day. I, yeah. I'm reading a dozen financial statements a month, you yeah. know, monthly reports and, uh, not at all. And, and the guys in the accounting group, they, they get a chuckle <laughs> when I ask my questions and they're like, Holy crap, you did pay attention. So they, 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 they're, they're amazed with uh, some of the things and some of the questions that I ask. And then they, of course, they say, I have my own accounting principles mm-hmm. that now we just should be done this way and that way. And <laughs> so we have a lot of fun with it. We have a lot of fun. It's awesome. Well, now your, your kids are of age. They're all working for Viking. What advice did you give them before they started their careers there? And, and what do you see for them? Very much like, like me. I mean, they weren't sweeping the floors at 10, but they were sweeping them at 14 or 15. And that was so they could come and hang out with their grandfather. Mm-hmm. You no, know, he, he, you know, he didn't treat them like 14 or 15 year olders. He treated them like young men. He, he barked at them. Yep. He talked away in a Marine talks, mm-hmm. you know, he, he didn't hold anything back. He let it all fly. And they kind of enjoyed that, you know? And, uh, so they enjoyed coming here and he would walk down the production line with them and he would do a lot of different things. And, uh, he, 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 he enjoyed them being here. They, and they enjoyed being here. And, uh, so th- again, they're boat builders, you know, that, that was, there wasn't any selection of what they were going to do in life. They were boat builders and both of them have embraced it a hundred percent. Um, so that was, again, it was easy. It was very, very easy to get them to, to hear. And, you know, we'll disagree on some things and they know more than I do. Um, you know, and they're only at it a couple, three, four years. And, you got to bark at them and explain to them though, that I've been here doing this for 30 plus years. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's all good. It's great to have them here every day. My daughter, she's a sophomore. Guess where she's, she's junior at school in Philadelphia. Guess where? All right. St. Joe's. St. Joe's. Uh, Joe's. (laughs) That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And she's a, She's a social media marketing major. Well, you know, if you, if you could go back and give one piece of advice to yourself when you were a teenager while we, you were working for Viking, what would it be? Ooh. Oh, man, that's pretty good. I mean, I enjoyed every part of it. Um, uh, I, I mean, I enjoyed every part of it. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't regret anything of how it happened, even the battles with my dad. You know, I think that created and, and, and helped me become the boat builder that I am. If you believe in something, you stay persistent on it. Yeah. Even, even when somebody tells you no, 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 no. And you're, yo, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so I, I, it's hard to say that, uh, that there's anything that I live to regret. I mean, the people, I, I, you know, I, I think I was very tenant tentative with, how to do it. And, 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 and I worked hard at getting direction and achieving the end results that any of the mentors that I worked with, uh, gave me. So I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with how everything went. Um, could we have accelerated it faster, but you know what? The, the, of course I wanted to move faster than my dad did, but my dad yeah. won. My grandfather was the same way. And my father worked with my grandfather and he wasn't he wasn't going to go out and buy equipment and cranes and this and that, that he didn't have buy for cash. Cause he went through the depression. And so a, did we go fast enough in some of the things that we did in developing some of the boats? No, but you know what? Here we are today. Last guy standing, you know what I mean? We're the yeah. last guy standing and standing very strong. Oh yeah. Better than anybody ever has done in this industry. You know, that that's our gig. We're better than anybody that's ever been in this industry in this type of boat. Uh, you know, we're, we're over 4,000 boats now in our history. 
And I've been around for, you know, just close to 3,000 of those boats. So it's, uh, and, you know, we, we developed a new company, Valhalla Boat Works, and yep. all the Palm Beach Towers, AME, Atlantic Marine Electronics, the two service centers, um, they've all been great, 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 great deals. I mean, they, they've been wonderful uh, additions to make us a better company. All good stuff. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, we're, we're sitting here and it's 2020. And as you know, and I know, it's, it's been an absolutely crazy year for a lot of people and disastrous for, fun, for, for a lot of people. But, uh, you know, we found ourselves in an industry where we're pretty lucky. Uh, boating's grown over the past year. We've got, gained thousands of new boaters. What were your thoughts when COVID first came on the scene and how has Viking fared through the crisis? I was in Florida uh, when it was all starting to, uh, my daughter was on spring break. We knew that it was going to, there was issues coming, but all of a sudden it was upon us. You know, that first 10 days of March, that's when the NBA players were showing up and having issues and canceling basketball games. And that, you know, that really brought it to the national attention is once we went into uh, uh, that and uh, and you know we flew down commercially and uh, and then having to come home and thankfully you know we had masks and gloves already in Florida from some work that was being done in the house and it happens to be all it was happened to be all the right stuff so we geared up and got on the airplane and uh, we came back and uh, I came back to that Tuesday. Well, I came back on Monday and Tuesday, we got the report that we had a positive Corona case and that, w- and it was not a, the, 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 um, the boat builder had been on a holiday and he had gone to a wedding and that that's where it was traced to the wedding. And fortunately he, he had only been to back to Viking for half a day. And he was in our plant engineering maintenance group and he wasn't involved. He was on a project in an area that there wasn't any interaction with anybody else. Uh, but then we had, of course, the hysteria of that seven, eight other people were like, Oh, I don't feel right. This and that. And we were very fortunate. Uh, we have our own medical group here at the facility. Uh, and they had uh, Steve Marks who heads it up our doctor and, he was lucky to get from LabCorp in February. He went out and got 200 tests, swab tests. Uh, by the time we needed them in March, we couldn't get them. But he had gotten them in February before it was vogue to have them. Yeah. He had the foresight to get them. So we swabbed up the first guy three days later or two days later. Thursday, we're told positive. And oh, here, wow. that was tested on Tuesday. And then we tested Wednesday and Thursday an additional seven, eight people. We're figuring, and the whole country's shutting down. I mean, we're, 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 we're popping everybody. We're, we're going to pop. We're going eight for eight. And it was like, okay, shut her down. Shut down the new Gretna facility for three weeks shut down the Mullica facility. And we never had a case in Mullica, but we shut it down because we figured if it was in one place, it's, and, and this was all community spread, not facility spread. Yeah. And um, we, we ended up uh, going one for eight, one positive, seven negatives. Oh. Never thought in a million years that would be it, but we had already made the case and then it was PP. P money. I was out in the community giving away our fa- our masks, our M95s, mm-hmm. going to our local hospitals, our local urgent cares, EMTs, fire departments. I gave away close to three thousand between suits, masks, booties, hoodies, all of that to all of our first responders. Oh wow! Because uh, we weren't going to need them in that three yeah. weeks. Uh, but what we did happen during that period of time, we had a lot of boat builders in that downtime catch the corona 
and community spread. Gotcha. So then we started testing, coming back to work with the, you know, we, we, we always had PPE equipment, never, never was without, we, we, we just had plenty of it. And so we equipped, we text, text, uh, we did temperatures. We, it was a six to four thirty start and stop. We started now five thirty quarter to six, 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 15, six 30. So you wouldn't have a thousand people coming to work all at the same time. Mm. So what we did is we went into staggered starts and stops, staggered lunch, uh, facility, uh, facility cleaning, uh, absolutely 100% enforced all the CDC guidelines of, of washing your hands. We've got stands all over the place. We, we've got it, everything, suits, masks, everything, uh, to the point where uh, we wouldn't, the, we, we, a lot of our Hispanic and our Vietnamese would commute together. And we said, guys, four person per car, completely masked up, and no longer, you know, they would come in um, vans, 10 people uh, in a van. Yeah. Can't, can't do it. Uh, can't do it. Six people, that's it. You're going to have to, and, you know, we gave a little supplement to help them out on some gas money because it was going to increase their commute and all that. But, uh, you know, we really clamped down and, um, you know, and we, we did pretty good. We, we had some cases. Uh, we were only down to three that could be traced that it was brought in from the community spread and the community spread to a three boat builders. Other than that, everything else was traced to outside this facility. So all in all, uh, and we, we haven't, you know, I'm not going to say it because that's the doom and it always gets you, but it's been a while since we've had a positive case. Uh, our medical group has done a wonderful job in, in taking care of those that have been affected and there's no question that strain of the COVID-19 back in uh, March, February, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, March and April is different than what it is today. I mean, I don't know if it's because you walked around with it and kept getting more and more and more of it. Now, you know, we're, we're checking, te we check temperatures every day. And yeah. I just, I'm last Friday, uh, I'm sorry, this Monday in our, our uh, Monday morning meeting, I said, Hey, listen, I, I, I want to see all of the today's uh, temperature readings. And, and I just went through every one of them and we're still, we, we made barriers with acrylic barriers or guy would walk right up once he got to a certain point in the plant. And that supervisor for his group would, would take the temperature of each and every person. And we're doing that today. And anybody that, that, uh, and, and we set it at 99, uh, we, you know, we, we set it at a degree lower than everybody else. And I said, I don't want anybody in here because this is devastating. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you something to get the people. We lost a hundred people through the shutdowns five, five weeks at Mullica, three weeks in New Gretna, but we had a hundred people abandon their job. Oh, uh, wow. because, uh, and that's difficult in today's world to replace those hundred, uh, let alone it wanting to expand because of uh, wiped out all of our dealer inventory, our inventory and a solid backlog of way over a year. Yeah. That's uh, I mean, inventory has been short industry wide and, and, you know, like I said before, it seems like demand has increased. Um, how have you guys been keeping up with the, the demand? We have it. We're selling backlog now. You know, I mean, gotcha. it's great. It's yeah. The, the, it, it's the best position I think this industry has been in since 2006. The, the, unfortunately, a lot of industries rebounded after 2008, 9, 10, 11. Mm -hmm. uh, but the boating industry really never did rebound. Yeah. Um, we got you know where we rebounded was from not having. We're being the only really builder in this segment mm -hmm. our competition has gone away uh and if they are still here they're a fraction of what they once were yeah and it, it's very difficult to compete with us we're you know we're 1500 strong when it's all said and done with all of our our marine group companies i mean they're mm -hmm. we're big 
in, in, in this and, uh, and very good at it. So it's very difficult to, to compete with us. Yep. Um, and you know, that's just, that is what it is. You know, it's, uh, we do it with the same group of managers that we've been doing it together for 30 years. Or, you know, you know, we got, you know, guys have been here five or six years, but I mean, most of us, the majority of us have been together for a long time and we all started at the same time, you know, when we were 18, 19, 21, 22, 23. I mean, and we all, we were all wanted to be boat builders. This is what we wanted to be. We're all fishermen and boat builders yeah. and, and, and river rats, you know, that's, yeah. that's all we are. <laughs> can't beat that experience. You can't beat that passion. You know, people have been doing it together for that long, that kind of camaraderie, that kind of teamwork. That That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, you know, and as I said, we've gained thousands of new boaters in 2020. What do you think the keys are to, to keeping them in boating in 2021 and beyond? Make it simple and easy. Yeah. Make it enjoyable. Help them when they need help. Um, smother them with help when they need help. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the fisheries have never been stronger. You know, back when I started, the fisheries weren't as good as they, the stocks were wiped out yeah. uh, from a lot of commercial fishing. So we've been very successful in doing what we've done in the fisheries over the last 20 years. And the stocks are, are excellent. So a, a lot of activity to catch fish, uh, a lot of activity to, to keep people enthralled with it. And a lot of boaters, you know, half, at least half, if not more, of the boaters that we saw come to our industry in the last six months, they were in it before they got out of it. Yeah. They had other things to do, mm -hmm. other places to go. And it was like, you know what? What is a great way to keep my family together so I can keep an eye on them and keep them safe? Boating. Yeah. So that was that was a big key. These were a lot. I mean, I would say, yeah, half of them may be new boaters that have looked at being in it and maybe rode along with other people on their boats, but they're all familiar with it. Yeah. At least our customers are. Um, I mean, we're selling boats to guys that have. 38, nine foot outboards to 42 foot outboards that are buying 80 footers and 72 footers and 58 footers. They're making the big jump. That's why we got involved with the hollow boat works and designed that brand of boats because it was an entry in and, and we're, we're being, we've already taken, we've delivered 70 of those boats in the first year and four of those buyers have already traded in and are having new Vikings built. Hmm. One is a Viking previous Viking owners, but the other three are, are young guys that uh, got in and now they want to go bigger already. So that's, you know, that's in the first year, next year it'll be 10 yeah. people. The year after that'll be 20. And that's how we keep our market share and we build our market share. That's awesome. That's awesome. You mentioned Valhalla Boatworks, your new sister company. Um, you're making amazing center consoles there. How'd that come about? And uh, and do you have anything else in store for us for 2021? Well, I mean, Don Gamel, one of uh, was our one of our demo captains. He moved into our engineering group down in Florida, and he and I always wanted to do this. And this 18 years ago, I pulled a file out. Now it's probably 18, 18 and a half years ago. Pulled out a file, and he and I designed up like a 28 footer. And it never got anywhere because the timing wasn't right. And, of course, we were swamped with orders and backlog and facility was jammed and overflowing with what we got and all of that. And in 2018, I saw that the industry, no matter what we tried, no matter what we did, we could get to a certain level, but we couldn't get beyond that level. And, and I said, OK. Well, the industry's gotten smaller. Uh, we've got the biggest market share. Uh, we need to go in a completely different direction. And that's where the, and my two sons, my, uh, my father and my one son, Sean, talked about doing it in the old post facility, post marine and Mays Landing. My dad lives a quarter mile from that facility. And, uh, 
they were talking about doing it five years ago and saw Michael Peters walking down the dock on a Monday uh, or Sunday of the Miami boat show. And I said, Michael, come on in and sit down. Uh, Michael had done our motor yacht design and done some work, did the 42 uh, pod boat that we did. And, um, and, and I said to Michael, I said, you know, I, I, I think I want to do an outboard boat. That's the hottest sector of this industry. And, and, you know, I want to take a little nostalgia with us. Our first three fiberglass boats were basically um, our, our most popular fiberglass, 33 footer, 37, 41. Uh, and I said, I'd like to do it in those side ranges. And this is what I'd like to do. And, and you know, this is how I want our tow rail on it. I want our shear on it, our dash, our transom fish box, uh, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And David Wilson, I'd like you to work with David Wilson and Ryan Higgins and and myself and, and Lonnie Rudd. Of course, Lonnie heads up that entire group and does an incredible job. And that's what we did. And within nine months, we had three models designed. And um, we, we do our all our own tooling. So we did our tooling and uh, we got all three of them in the water. And, and I said, listen, we can't do one model at a time. We have to do all three simultaneously. And, of course, my guys are looking at me. I'm like, ah, listen, guys, we do 92-footers. We do 93-footers. You're kidding me? Talking about a 33, a 37, and a 41. They're like, uh, okay. And, of course, they were totally different builds. But we, I knew we were we're the best boat builders there are. Yeah. And we, we did it. We pulled it off and had all three boats last September of uh of 19 in atlantic city for our dealer meeting and then we went on to sell 70 boats in the first year and we're i have 110 boat backlog we'll build 91 boats this year and you asked the question earlier what's in store for this year a, a v46 we'll make its debut at our vip show in uh in january uh and then on to the miami boat show hopefully awesome. And uh, we also have a, a new 54 uh, Viking that we are uh, debuting at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show. So all good new new design sells. We do it all ourselves in-house. We design our boats uh, and we do all our own tooling. And uh, Michael does the bottoms and he does, you know, a lot of the, you know, making sure it all works. But uh, it's a great step. The, the Valhalla's are a step tall, which is the way to be in the center console world today. Having a step haul is uh, for performance, for ride, for everything. Uh, he has a tunnel in the back of, of his, which gives you locks in your steering. The biggest issue with step haul boats were steering. They got a little hairy in some turns because uh, you could go so fast. And uh, But now with what he has done, it's, it's a great haul. Uh, and within 10 years, it won't be anything other than a step tall boat, step tall boat. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that's amazing. Um, you know, I got one last question for you here and, and, uh, I kind of wanted to get to this because, uh, you know, with your background in fishing and I've, I've been a fisherman my whole life. And I think fishing has a lot of lessons, but, but also a lot of life lessons. What are some of the life lessons you've gotten from fishing and, and how much is fishing still a part of your life? If I could fish every day, still I would. Mm -hmm. uh, what have I have learned is conservation, respect the resource, uh, respect Mother Nature, be smart about it, always have a plan, make sure everybody knows where you're going, when you're leaving, and when you should be back. Um, you know, I haven't gotten too many sketchy situations, but the more you're on the water, Inevitably, you get in a spot or two where the weather isn't what it was supposed to have been and things like that. Boats break down, uh, put you in a little different situation. So I've been through it all. Always stay calm. Always keep your head about you. Have great electronics. Be able to communicate and, um, and res respect everything about a boat, about the ocean, and about what you're going to do. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Pat, number one, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I just want to acknowledge you. I, you know, I, 
hear stories all the time of entrepreneurs out there and, and people trying to become entrepreneurs. But when you're actually in the thick of it and, and you're trying to solve these problems on the fly, it's, it's another matter entirely. And, and your company is a, is a real inspiration in what you do. The boats that you build are inspirational. You just look at a Viking on the water and you know, it, it almost gets, gives me goosebumps every time I see one out there. So I want to thank you for everything. I want to thank you for the awesome work you're doing. Doing. And uh, I want to thank you for all the information you brought here today. How can people learn more about Viking and Valhalla Boatworks and, and your other projects? Well, hey, anybody, anytime they want to come to Gretna, just call up, schedule a tour. We'll get you through. And uh, anybody can come anytime, whether they're a buyer or they're just coming to see the product. The, you know, what we look at is the more we can educate people about a Viking the, the better off we are. So, I mean, we do it differently than anybody else and we do it better than anybody else. Awesome. Awesome. Well, again, Pat, thank you so much to everybody out there. I want to thank you guys so much for listening. We'll get some links up to uh, all of Viking Yachts websites and, and things like that on the show notes for this episode. And with that, we'll be back at you later on with some more awesome content. This is Chris Albert and Pat Healy, and we are out. All right, there you have it, guys. That is our interview with Mr. Pat Healy of Viking Yachts. I hope you got a lot out of that episode. And stay tuned because we've got a lot more awesome episodes coming to you. We've got Mr. Dave Marciano from Wicked Tuna coming up for you next week. And we also have Mr. Ken Clinton, the president of Intrepid Power Boats. He's coming up on a future episode. So stay tuned. These episodes will be published each week. And um, you know what? Please let people know that we exist. Share these episodes out. Let people know that American-made boating is on the scene, teaching everybody about the power of American industry in boating. And uh, I want to thank you guys so much for listening. We'll be back at you next week with another awesome episode. This is Chris Albert with American-made boating, and I am out.